Hey, what's going on, everybody, and welcome to Today in Space, the All Things Space Science podcast. This week, we are going to be talking with Dr. Tanya Harrison, Tanya of Mars, uh, as she's known online, and she's a planetary scientist. She's been, she's had a really cool career. She's worked on Mars satellites, Mars rovers. She's now going to start doing some of her own stuff. She's an author. We talk about her book and kind of that process a little bit. But it was uh, an honor to get to know her a little bit more and to have this hour we could sit down and talk about all things space. So it was it was great to have her as one of our people of science. We're going to get into that in just a second here. A little bit of business. As always, if you want to help support the podcast, the easiest thing, the free thing, uh, that that helps us so much is to leave a review on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, uh, let people know what you like about the podcast. People will look at that as it goes through the algorithm, and then it sends us across uh, the internet uh, to reach more people like yourself. So uh, obviously you can share the podcast with people in your life, in real life. That is, I think, how this podcast has grown the most, and we've got a cool community that we're building here. You can follow us online, Today in Space Pod, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, we got Today in Space podcast Facebook page. Uh, we're putting up uh, reels on there. We've got YouTube Today in Space. Like, subscribe. There's also the new Starship Rocket Pen, which is finished here. And you can go check it out at ag3d.etsy.com. And that is uh, $65 on there as a podcast listener. We're not we're not promoting this code. It's only for the people listening and watching this podcast that have stayed two and a half minutes into the episode. Uh, there is a 25% off code uh, if you use RUD23. That's RUD23. And you get 25% off in the store for being a podcast listener. We've got tons of cool stickers and a lot of extra goodies we're going to be throwing in there. So if you can help support the podcast with our first real merch, go to eg3dprinting.etsy.com. Helps us out a bunch. And another way that you can help support the podcast and help us meet more people and, and get this podcast to a place where you know we're able to go down and fund some missions to go see Starship and all that stuff. So thank you for joining us for Today in Space. And welcome Dr. Tanya Harrison to the podcast. Welcome to Today in Space, everybody. I am, as always, your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex Girofanos, and today we're back for another episode of People of Science, where we get to talk to people who work in the industry, and we get to talk about their passions, where it started. It's a great jump into, if you're someone who's young, maybe getting into college, trying to figure out if they should get into STEM, if you're in STEM and you like hearing about those stories, or if you found yourself outside of STEM and you're looking to get back in. That's what this show is all about. So uh, this week, our person of science is an acclaimed planetary scientist, author, and passionate advocate for space exploration, and has captivated audiences around the globe with her unparalleled expertise and contagious enthusiasm. Dr. Tanya Harrison, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, and thanks for being here. Uh, let's, as we start with all these episodes, uh, we like to break into everyone's STEM origin story. Um, so tell us where the passion started, and you, you have such a cool career, so we'd love to just take a quick trip um, and, and talk about uh, what you're doing and how you got there. Sure. It's been a little bit all over the place, but <laughs> I've loved space ever since I was very, very young. Um, growing up watching a lot of Star Trek, like Star Trek Next Generation started when I was two or three. Um, and my parents watched it, so I watched it with them. And uh, then a couple of main influences alongside Star Trek, there was the book, The Magic School Bus Lost in the Solar System. I was obsessed somewhere somewhere on the shelf behind me. I still have my copy from 1989 where my mom had written my name in the front. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, there was a film that also came out in 1989 called Big Bird in Japan, which seems mm. a little random, <laughs> but in the movie, Big Bird goes to Japan and he ends up meeting the mythological Japanese moon princess, Kaguya Heime. Oh, wow. And 
the moon doesn't really have anything to do with the the film itself but for some reason I thought it was really cool and so I started going out every night and I would stare at the moon uh and then I just got obsessed with the night sky from that Hmm. and so that was kind of like general space enthusiasm and then I really honed in on Mars specifically in 1997 when the Pathfinder mission landed and Pathfinder took some images of the little Sojourner rover driving off of the lander onto the surface. And this was the first successful rover anybody had sent to another planet, which blows my mind that that was that recently, 1997. Yeah. Um, but seeing this at, as a, I guess, an 11 year old at the time, I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I have to work on Mars rovers. And so I became very singularly focused at that point, And I was completely obsessed with mars oh that's awesome so uh sojourner and pathfinder so we're how are you following along because I, I for those missions we don't have like we have now like space twitter and all the stuff we have online how are you following along pathfinder was actually the first nasa mission to have a website and so they were putting a lot of updates on there in terms of the pictures you know very small in comparison to the internet today <laughs> um some little animated gifs like uh, sojourner driving off the lander platform oh, wow. they were doing updates i think there was even like a, a phone number that you could call for mission updates and there's That's an archived cool. version of the mission website like still online like they mm-hmm. they encapsulated it so that you could see what it looked wow. like as if you were seeing it in 1997 oh that's beautiful <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's very cool so so how did you get involved into STEM? So you, so you were focused on working on rovers. Um, what was your, did you have a thought process? Were you just focused and, and looking for all different types of uh, possibilities? Uh, I'm, I'm interested to know because it's it seems like everyone has a slightly different approach to getting involved in science. And, and you did end up working with these rovers. So we'd love to hear uh, what, what happened. What was the course? Well, I had the thought planets are in space, so I should be an astronomer. So I went into astronomy and physics for my undergrad at the University of Washington. And I learned partway through that process that astronomy is great if you want to study something like how planets form or um, yeah, evolution of planets, evolution of solar systems in general. But if you want to study Mars itself or a, a similar planet, it's not really astronomy that moves into more geology. Mm. And I, I toyed with the idea of being an engineer because I thought the engineers on Star Trek were very cool. The fact that they yeah. could just fix spaceships. It was like, mm. oh, I could build a rover. <laughs> um, but I lack those skills. Like I'm not good at building things. I'm a more conceptual person, mm. <laughs> I learned. So uh, I said, okay, I'm going to be a scientist. And when I was finishing up my undergrad like getting close to the end my advisor had suggested two possible pathways he said well you could either switch course and do a master's degree in um, geology go do the mars stuff you want to do or you could just keep being astronomer you could keep on the phd path and go get a phd in astronomy Hmm. Um, so i applied to both programs hoping the universe would make the decision for me I got into both of them, so I had to make the decision uh, myself. I was like, oh, okay, I guess I have to be decisive here. Yeah. And that's when I was like, okay, well, Mars has been your dream. And even though it's kind of a pivot from, you know, when you're in academia, the PhD is like the thing you do, right? They don't right. tell you about any other pathways, especially not in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. Um, so I pivoted to a master's degree in geology instead and that was definitely the right move because I, I think if I had stayed in astronomy, um, I was doing like metal content of stars, which was interesting, but I wasn't passionate about it the way that I was obsessed with something like Sojourner. Yeah, I, I think that finding the passion of it is super important. And I think the more I talk to a lot of folks who either never got into it or are still trying to find their gig. I mean, I went to school for aerospace engineering with like a concentration in um, in astromechanics. And it's such a specialized degree that it actually, this is 2012 to 2014, the, the amount of jobs for that, especially in the Boston area, weren't really around. So um, it's cool that you were able to kind of pinpoint that career at that point. I think that's a challenging, I think it comes down to timing. It's good to hear that you had that advisor as like a, a person who 
who had your back. Um, was that someone that you, you found or just lucky enough to have a, have a good advisor like that? Um, I actually found them in trying to find people doing Mars things at the university. Oh. So they weren't even in, in the department that I was in, but I had started poking around to see, is there anybody here doing it at all? Maybe I mm. could just switch to geology and stay at UW and not have to go somewhere else. Um, so I ended up doing kind of like independent research separate from my like technically my undergraduate studies yeah. in astronomy and physics with some folks over in the um uh earth and space sciences department which is just UW's name for geology and they were doing mapping of layers in the northern polar cap of mars with mars global surveyor data and that I thought was super cool. Unfortunately, our hypothesis for whatever we were studying was completely shattered with a single high-rise image when Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter got to Mars. <laughs> but that's science for you. That's why we send new missions. <laughs> totally. Ah, that's cool. But that's great advice, though. I think, I think, uh, you know, I know personally, I learned that lesson a few years in that, you know, just go find people who are working on the same stuff. I think that's, that's super important. Um, so, so tell me, so the geology thing, you did your master's, um, what was some of the cool stuff that you learned then and, and that kind of helped you out later? Uh, it ended up being a good transition. Like in astronomy, I was mostly doing spectroscopy. And so when I made the switch to geology, I stayed doing spectroscopy just in a different part of the spectrum. Um, so shifting from, my oh gosh, I can't remember what I was doing in undergrad, uh, looking at hydrated minerals on Mars. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that experience that I really liked doing Mars things. So that was good. I'm glad yeah. my illusion had not been shattered. <laughs> um, but I didn't really enjoy the squiggly line aspect. Like I, mm. I liked looking at the pictures more. And by the time I got to the end of my master's, like my grad school experience was not great overall. And so I wasn't sure I wanted to stick around for a PhD that university didn't offer PhD, so I wouldn't have stayed there, but I didn't know if I wanted right. to stay in academia. So instead, mm -hmm. I started emailing a bunch of the people that had written the papers that I read for my thesis, uh. just seeing like, does it, hey, does anybody need a data processing lackey? Because mm -hmm. I had done that a lot in undergrad with like Hubble Space Telescope data and some of the ground-based wow. telescopes on the Earth. Cool. And I knew from that I liked working on the data, like actually getting my hands in the data I thought was really cool. And one of the people that I happened to email said, oh, you should look at this company, Mail and Space Science Systems. Um, they do operations for a bunch of the cameras at Mars. Mm. And I never would have looked there on my own because I would have assumed a company that builds cameras probably just wants engineers. Right. They just happened to be looking for an assistant staff scientist where they wanted someone with a master's degree. They actually specifically did not want people with PhDs. Ah. Um to do operations for the context camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And I was like, this is perfect. I applied yeah. immediately. I was like, my stuff is still packed from like graduating. Like I could be there, oh, you know, in like a day, I just got to drive. <laughs> and they're like, slow your roll. We got to do like, there's a whole interview process. So it took a couple months, but eventually I got hired. Um, and literally just like road tripped my way down to San Diego and was like, I'm living the dream. This is amazing. Yeah, it's a free <laughs> adventure. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. That is exciting. So you, I, I love that idea. And it, it's so simple. It's great advice that, you know, so much of science is about the data, but I mean, so much uh, else of it, it's humans doing science, right? And mm -hmm. and making those connections. Um, so how, how was that, that work? The work itself was amazing. Mm -hmm. The fact that you know, a lot of people that are doing science, they're using data that are coming back from these missions, mm -hmm. but it's a whole different thing to be the person that's actually commanding what these robots are doing. Right. And at that stage, in, when I came onto Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we were in the first, I came in like right at the beginning of what's called the first extended mission phase. Mm -hmm. So we kind of gone through the initial checkout period of like what NASA had funded the mission to do. And so once you get into the extended mission phases, you get a little bit more flexibility because it's almost like bonus time. You're like, oh, mm. cool. The mission yeah. lasted longer than we expected. Um, so it, it was very 
it was very independent in a lot of ways. It's just like, once they trained you, you would go in your office. I just like put on my headphones and be listening to tool or something like that. And like picking what this camera would take pictures of on (laughs) Mars. And like every morning I would come in and I'd look at all the pictures that had come back from the day before. And a lot of times scrolling through them, it's like, oh, you're the first human to ever see this picture from Mars. Like no one else has seen this except for you. And the novelty of that never wore off like I I would want to dance my way in in the mornings because I'm just like I can't wait to see what we're gonna find on Mars today (laughs) and it's like what was that a little bit of that process like because I think for some folks it's hard to uh like the data that's coming in and then what you're taking a look at it could could you break that down a little bit of what that's like sure so Um, like it'll vary between instruments and missions. Um, but like specifically for this camera, we, we would, um, plan out what the camera was going to take pictures of in one week and two week segments for like two different operational modes of the camera. Mm -hmm. Um, and you would like pick everything that you wanted to have. Like if you could take up the whole, like all the bandwidth that was coming back from Mars, you kind of put in like your dreams <laughs> and then <laughs> everybody else would do that too for all the other instruments on the oh, spacecraft. Wow. Then JPL would run some magic algorithm to kind of divvy up who got what. And then th- mm-hmm. that would be like the beginning of the week. And then the second part of the week, you would get back the results of JPL's magic script and it would be like, so this is what you actually get. Mm. And then you can make some adjustments from there. And it, it, a lot of it is taking things into account like you're always operating as if the spacecraft could die tomorrow because you never right. know when it's going to fail right. so we image the planet in priority order uh, we would have a mm. database of targets quote unquote mm. that different people on the team would submit and uh give it a priority and then we would have things like you know if you're shooting something near the south pole for example you wouldn't be able to shoot that in winter. So you'd have to make sure that you're shooting the things you want to see at the right time of year when they're in daylight and when the weather's not bad. Mm. So that was another key part of my job was weather monitoring with another camera that that same company built called the Mars Color Imager or Marcy, Mm. which there was no targeting for that because it just did daily global color imaging of all of Mars in these pole to pole strips. Mm. Um, but we would analyze those to see, you know, how has the weather been over the last few days? Are there any places where there's storms? So we want to avoid them. Wow. Um, the weather on Mars is very repeatable year after year. And so we take things like that into account, like, oh, it's dust storm season in Acidalia. Don't take any pictures for the next couple of weeks. Or like, there's going to be a bunch of dust devils in like, I don't know, Arcadia. That's a bad example, but um <laughs> we we would know pretty well like when it would be bad times of year to image certain places Mm. um and if we had places where we were trying to do like a a campaign like maybe you had a really interesting place with a very uh like small window of time to image it my job would be to go through and look at all the historical data for these areas to figure out what the weather patterns were there so Somewhere I still have like a sticky note that I had written down of like, you know, Protonilus is Elsa Bess this to this and acid or um, uh, Hellas is Elsa Bess this to this, which was like, this is the one, one section of the year when the atmosphere is best. And you just mm. like shoot as many pictures there as you can until the season closes. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are really balancing a lot of different things as, as an operator of these instruments. Um, So you guys were in this extended phase of the mission. Was there, because, so I work as an engineer during the day and in tech, so there's not a lot of instructions for things because the, most of the stuff's not developed enough. Did you guys have anything like that where team members would be able to pass on like, okay, this instrument's a little wonky, or if you see this, it's, it's experiencing some kind of bug. Um, Did you guys have any of that? Or was it kind of like, you know, shoot from the hip and, and let us know if anything goes wrong? Um, usually that would be more on like the software side of things. Cause mm. like all the software to control this stuff is obviously like custom made. Right. Right. And a lot of it was probably a lot more old fashioned than y- most people would expect. Maybe as mm. an engineer, you wouldn't be surprised to know that like we were running these cameras off of shell scripts. Um, right. <laughs> cause they were developed, <laughs> like the software itself was developed 
for the cameras on Mars Observer in the early 1990s. Yeah. And it's and you kind don't of want like to just a, reprogram in a new language because then you've got all these bugs you'd have to deal with. Yeah. It's like yeah. if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And at the end of the day, what you're commanding it to do is is not all that complicated. It's, mm. you know, we would do the targeting for the context camera graphically. So we would plot up all the orbits for the mm. one or two week period and then kind of manually see where we wanted to place the footprint and then like adjust the footprint sizes. Mm. Um, so basically really all you're telling the camera is what is my start time and stop time along wow. orbit number X oh, cool. and how many, um, pixels wide basically do you want this to be? Cause it had mm. to be like the width and the length had to equal, or it couldn't be larger than a certain amount. Okay. Um, so you don't really need much complicated software. It gets more mm. complicated when you're talking about something like the rovers where, Mm. um like the cameras on curiosity for example have autofocus mechanisms but you can also manually focus them so that was more like python scripts where we would do things like control motor counts of the focusing mechanism we don't deal with that on the satellites that's good (laughs) yeah that's good so yeah keep going um where where does the story go from here um so eventually let's see yeah ctx and marcy then uh, the company also built the mast cameras, so the color mm-hmm. eyes of Curiosity, um, the Mars hand lens imager, which is the camera that takes really close-up pictures of rocks, but also all the selfies that you see coming back from Curiosity, mm-hmm. and the Mars descent imager, or MARTY, which was mounted on the belly of the rover and took the video as it was landing, or technically it was pictures, and we turned it into yeah. a video. <laughs> um, so those were i feel like this is where i have my controversial hot take of my career in that i actually really enjoyed working on the satellites more than working on the rovers from a day-to-day like operation standpoint Um, it's kind of jarring to go from like i said you're really independent on march reconnaissance orbiter by the time i came into the mission Mm. so we had like one meeting a week, which was usually to talk about the weather and maybe any other things that were coming up that week. Like if there was an event to be aware of or something mm. with the rovers, it's like multiple telecons a day. It's so many cooks in the kitchen for every mm. decision that you're making because you're so power constrained. And again, you're operating as if the mission could die tomorrow. So mm. there's a lot of like, you know, I want these watts. No, I need those four watts. Well, we want to drive today. Well, we can't drive and do science, but we need to get over there. Yeah. But if we don't like, if we need to do a trade-off of like what's over here versus what's over there, there's a lot of debating going on Yeah, and that's all necessary going through all this stuff. It was just so different from the process of coming in and being like, I basically control this camera with no input from anybody else. <laughs> totally. I, <laughs> that's I, an oversimplification, but no, but that's so cool. And it's, it's a great insight. I appreciate you sharing that. Like, um, I, I think another thing that's a, a misnomer when people get into science is, you know, they don't necessarily know what kind of jobs are out there and what mm-hmm. kind of advantages and disadvantages or just differences, um, like each role might have. And it sounds in my world, it would be a lot more like, uh, like budget debating, but I guess for you guys, it's it's electrical budgets and power budgets and yeah yeah. So that's that's it's interesting to think about from from the outside in. Cool. So so rover stuff. Um, which which has been your favorite to work on or work with? Um, and I why? feel like my heart is always with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I think because it was like the first and. I was just so heavily involved in it. Like when I, around the time that I decided to leave that job, um, one of the like bits of metadata that's attached in all the images is a a requester ID. And I'm not sure if it shows up on like the, the public NASA version of the data, but internally we could see it. Mm -hmm. And so I like ran a little script to request everything from my requester ID 90, which was me. I don't know where that number came from. Um, so that I could have a list of every image that I personally took of Mars. And it's literally 
thousands of images and that was never necessary that wouldn't have it wouldn't have ever been the case for a rover on the rover side i worked mm. as um what's called a payload downlink lead so mm. on for for ctx the the uplink and the downlink was one person so the targeter and the image mm. analyst um on the rover we had separate like payload uplink lead which would be the person that actually wrote the code to tell the cameras what to do and then we'd have the payload downlink lead that would analyze those images when they came back to see is the camera functioning properly like from an engineering standpoint hmm. and then um is there anything significant in that image because you would have to put together a a little report every day that you'd put on this uh, internal team website that says hmm. you know we we requested 10 images we got eight of them back this is what we saw in them like hmm. just um like quick quick summaries for all the people that didn't want to sit there and look at every single image. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, that's the part of the communicating process, right? Like if, mm -hmm. if we don't talk about it, then it gets lost kind of in the, in, in the, the noise. Um, that's very cool. Um, so, so after this, you're, you're working with, uh, after the rovers, what, what did you end up doing? And um, what do you, where did that lead you to today? what you're working on um so i worked at that job for four years and then i went back to school to get a phd so i moved mm -hmm. to canada um and i was studying gullies on mars which are mm -hmm. these very specific landforms that only occur in the middle and high latitudes mm -hmm. and so when they were first discovered back in the late 90s with mars global surveyor they caused a big uh, I don't, not uproar. They were very interested. Yeah. They're very interesting to the Mars science community because this suggested maybe there was some climate control on how they formed. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, they found two that were actually active today. So there was material that had flowed through them where we had an image before where that material wasn't there. Uh. And then an image after where it was. And while I was working on CTX, we had a a four month safe mode where the spacecraft was not operational mm. and we were all scared. We were going to lose our jobs because <sighs> you're, you're contracted to work yeah. on specific missions. So if the mission dies uh -huh. and there's not another one to transfer you onto, you, you'll get laid off. Um, mm. Thankfully it woke back up. MRO actually yeah. still works today, all these years <laughs> later. <laughs> um, but during that time I had gone through and documented where every gully on Mars was in all the data that we had historically from CTX before I had gotten onto the mission. Mm. And then my job was to look at all the images every day anyway. So I just took a lot of notes about where these things were. And then I had been kind of assigned to look for new gully activity in a few hundred specific monitoring sites that we would look at every few months. And I found eight or nine more of these. Uh, and then, um, they, they found like dozens more uh, even since then. So these are very mm -hmm. enigmatic features on Mars and there's a big debate of whether they are, uh, whether water is involved with them today or if they're mm -hmm. dry landslides. I'm very much in camp water. <laughs> I won't bore everybody with the geology, but if you want to know why it's water, go read my thesis. <laughs> there's many reasons why it's definitely water. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, but my intent there had been uh, like I really decided, you know, I knew I wanted, wanted to work on rovers and missions and that job experience helped me figure out, oh, I don't want to just work on it. Now I want to be the principal investigator of a mm. mission or an instrument to Mars. I want to actually lead the science strategy for doing one of these mm. missions. Cause I, I just thought it would be cool to be the person that designs that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, my old boss was like, don't do that. PIs are, are miserable people. They're so stressed. You don't get to do any <laughs> science, but you know, I was still pretty young at that point and like, um, doughy eyed and I'm like, no, I think it'd be so cool. Um, so my intent was I'll go get the PhD and I'll come like this company was a JPL subcontractor. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'll go get the PhD. I'll come back, but work at JPL actual, and then like use that as the springboard to be a PI. Mm -hmm. Well, I got like a curveball, like the, a year before I was 
planning on graduating with my PhD, um, Arizona State University kind of called me out of the blue and they said, hey, we have this thing called the New Space Initiative where we're working to partner the university with commercial space companies to do Mm -hmm. tech development and and missions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we're looking for somebody that's not interested in like a typical tenure track faculty type position. Mm -hmm. And someone had recommended you because I had been quite vocal about how I, I didn't really want to be a professor. That's not why I went back to school. I just, Mm -hmm. I I don't enjoy teaching. (laughs) Um, So uh, I said, okay, they like flew me down and kind of showed me around everything. And I said, okay, yeah, this, this seems really cool. And they said, okay, the catch is you need to graduate in like four months or something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I wasn't planning on finishing for a year. And I need, I was planning on like a bunch of field work for the last chapter of my thesis. So I accepted the job offer and then I had to like not sleep for four months basically oh to God. like complete a new research, like do all the research and then write the paper on the research for the last chapter of my thesis. That is hard. Um, yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. That was <laughs> very stressful. Uh, looking back now, I'm like, I don't even know how I did that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I did it, you know, I defended and then literally I like defended my thesis got in the car, drove from London, Ontario, all the way to Phoenix. And then the day after I got to Phoenix, I started my job at ASU. So it was like very quick. And uh, the person that had recommended me for the job pointed out, this is a really great way for you to survey the new space landscape to figure out if there's a company you might want to work for. And in the time that I had left to go back and get a PhD, the new space industry had become a thing. Like, Mm -hmm when I was at the master's level, the fact that I found the job at Malin was like miraculous. There, there were not very many job options for someone with a master's degree that wanted to study space as a scientist, as an engineer, Mm. I would have been fine. But as a scientist, like there are probably three options out there in like the whole country. Um, so, but in the meantime, you know, SpaceX actually started launching things and like all these other companies started popping up. And so, um, through that, I got connected with planet, which is a commercial earth observing satellite company. And, um, they, when I got involved with them, they were like 30 people at the beginning. Um, Mm. and I thought that they seemed really cool. And so, uh, I deviated from Mars for a little bit. I, I was at ASU for about three years and then I went to work at planet, um, and eventually ended up becoming their head of, global science strategy Mm. so it was kind of like checking off the the pi box it just set up for a mission it was for a company (sighs) so that was very unexpected um and it was a similar thing where like they uh, they called me and offered me a job out of the blue Mm. um so it was a little bit unexpected well it was a little unexpected i'd been trying to convince them that i was cool and they should hire me (laughs) and then like eventually they called and offered a job so that was convenient um, and then, uh, I left that job in January and now I'm working on, uh, new projects that are still like <laughs> somewhat in stealth mode, but yeah. basically like partly returning to Mars. So that should be good. And also returning a little bit to some themes of other stuff I worked on at ASU that was focused on kind of the human experience side uh-huh. of space, Um, So I'm really looking forward to delving back into some of that stuff because that was a lot of like creative fun work that I I really missed when I left the university to um, work on the commercial side of things. That's super exciting. I mean, conceptually, I'm sure that's super exciting because I mean, the next, I think it's going to take a while. We've got some work to do, but thinking about us living in space, I, I think we've, we had an era in the early years uh, post you know moon landing that we had a lot of ideas and then it kind of died off and and now we're at this point where we have a lot of the abilities to go into space booming um what what are some aspects especially let's let's go with mars uh for the human experience that is is in your mind that maybe people aren't thinking about right now for a trip to mars um so i think the biggest thing is 
you know, we're doing a lot of these, we call analog missions here on earth to try and simulate people living in a confined habitat with a small number of people for the length of a partial or full Mars mission. Um, But I think even in those simulations, people must know somewhere in the back of their mind, like you're still on earth. If something goes wrong, you, like they'll call an ambulance or so they can airlift you out right. like you're probably going to be yeah. okay i don't and I, so i think it's going to be really hard for us to simulate the full psychological aspect of being confined on a small ship with a small crew in an environment where once you've gotten just a little bit farther than the moon you can also you can't have real-time communication with anybody except right. the people on that ship and in a world where we're so interconnected constantly, yeah. I'm genuinely curious to see what happens there. It's mm. just so, so different from anything we've experienced for centuries. I mean, we're essentially going yeah. back to the era of sailing ships across the ocean and saying, well, yeah, hopefully you make it. I mean, we know where they are this time, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're a lot more like aware of stuff, but you're right, it is it is that expedition it is that journey um and it's it the psychological thing is crazy because you think about the pressure uh, um of of not only you know do you need to do everything that you're planning on right uh you also have to make that return mission and and a lot of the analog missions don't don't have the journey there or the journey back kind of in that mix as well and uh um that's a long journey (laughs) And you can miss that window to return and you've got another two something years before you can even think about it again. Um, wow. That's, that's cool. Um, yeah. The human factor side is like, we know how to do life support. We we've made a lot of strides in, you know, growing food in space. Uh, a lot of the work I did at ASU was focused on kind of the, the sensory experience. Like how do we make eating more enjoyable so that you're not just eating rehydrated mush the whole way there um and how can you create more immersive virtual reality experiences to give them like entertainment and help them Mm. not feel so homesick on the journey to mars um but really i think that that's the human response is the biggest wild card there it's just Mm. a whole another order of magnitude compared to being on the space station where you have an escape capsule and the earth is literally right there you can see it and even the moon i mean if Apollo 13 had happened on the way to Mars, th- those That's people it. would have been screwed. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, they would have been. They would have been screwed. Absolutely. <laughs> um, it's 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 not even a question. Um, y- you had me thinking about something there, but um, we'll, we'll come back to it. Uh, going back to say the moon, right? Um, with Artemis two. What what has you excited there, and and maybe take the human experience aspect of it too. Um, what about what they're doing with this? Is you know has you excited? I I'm excited that they are involving you know other countries, which is great. Canada yeah. is very excited that Jeremy Hansen <laughs> is going at least around the moon, even if he doesn't get to land on the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we're getting our first woman astronaut to go around the moon and to set foot on the moon. And so I think that's going to help connect more people with the idea of humans going back to the moon yeah. um, and hopefully let it hopefully make it feel less like, you know, America is coming back to plant a flag and more humanity yeah. is returning to the moon. Um and the fact that they the branding is very much like we're going back to the moon to stay. Mm. I really hope that that's the case. I don't want this to end up just being like, oh, we visit it again, and then it takes fifty more years before anything happens. But totally. it feels, it feels like it's going to happen this time, just with how much work yeah. is going into it. No, totally. And you and you've seen the, you know, the drought to the boom that we've had recently. I mean, we've we've had a roller coaster ride emotionally of of going back to space since since the moon landing, uh, and and even the shuttle era, which you know was such a long, uh, grand adventure, but you know kept us in in low Earth orbit still. Um, for for the uh, the Artemis two stuff, some of the stuff that I thought was really interesting was, you know, a lot of the radiation protection and just procedures that they have 
when they're inside deep space, which is a whole other beast of keeping people alive. Um, for the moon landing stuff, um, we go back to your, your book, and it's kind of the theme of what you were just talking about. Um, your book for all humankind um, was was really. I was just listening to that the other day, actually, um, and it, it's cool because you're that event, that moon landing. Even though it was, uh, you know, white men landing on the moon for America, putting a flag down, it, especially in its time, it was kind of smacking in the face of everything that was kind of common conception. Um, and and even though there's still tons of progress to still be had today. Um, I loved your theme of that book. Um, could you tell folks a little bit about like the process of, of getting that together and, and learning about the stories that weren't just the people that actually went to the moon? Yeah. The, the idea for the book came up from actually a meeting from this sensory project at ASU. Oh, we had gathered together on a weekend to jam on something completely unrelated. Um, but during the lunch break, uh, there were a lot of people that had come to be a part of the project who were not part of the space department. Mm. And so we kind of went around the room and did like a round robin, you know, what got you interested in space? And there was a professor there who was uh, probably in his late 50s, early 60s from Sudan. And he started telling us about his memories of the moon landing. And I thought, wow, you never get to hear the stories of people from this from outside the United States. It's always, yeah. you know, the the people that got inspired by Apollo and became rocket scientists, or just in general, like you know, maybe your parents or grandparents mentioned that they watched it. Right. Um, and it, so I I decided, you know, I want to track down more of these stories and uh, discover that it's very difficult to track down people who were. <laughs> old enough to clearly remember the day like lives that happened yeah and were not american or russian because i didn't want any like influence mm. from the the cold war and the space race on the story sure. um ah, interesting yeah yeah those people are not on the internet <laughs> <laughs> there are not a yeah. lot of them so a lot of it ended up being like um you know being connected to like parents or grandparents through their children through some calls on social media um some connections through people that we already happened to know um the the first the first interview chapter the um ellie the holocaust survivor he just happened to be someone that my co-author danny bednar i think he had interviewed him as part of his thesis work because danny's a human geographer and so I approached him to work with me on the book because I said, I have no formal ex experience in interviewing people. Sure. Um, and I feel like there's probably a, a process to this. It should be a little bit more organized than my like fly by night, you know, just tell me about <laughs> your memories of the moon landing. <laughs> um, and so he was great with that. He helped to oh, make awesome. sure that like we asked every person the same set of questions so we could at least mm. build the similar narrative, you know, um. what what was the time like for you and where you were growing up um, or not necessarily growing up because some of the people in the book were adults at the time, some were mm -hmm. children. Uh, but like, yeah, what was the hype around what was happening before the moon landing? What happened on the day, like your memories of the actual event? Mm -hmm. And then how did that impact you moving forward as somebody who in essentially all but one case in the book were people that did not go on to work in the space industry. And that was also very intentional. I didn't think we needed mm -hmm. more stories from people who got inspired by Apollo to become rocket scientists. How did right. the, how did this affect, you know, university students or teachers or mm -hmm. pilots, you know? Um, so I didn't know what the theme would end up being coming into it, interviewing so many different people from so many different countries so mm. it's it's serendipitous that all of their messages were consistent in every single interview. Mm. Um, and the interviews themselves, some of them were fun. Some They were all fun. Some were extremely emotional. Uh, mm. Like we had a few where we had um, uh, children acting as translators for their parents. Oh. And so we got to see the bonding between the children and the parents or like the child and the parent, adult children. Um, but some of them had said, you know, I never thought to sit down and ask my parents about this. And it, it was 
it was fun to see them basically like interviewing each other as we're feeding them the questions in yeah. English and then they would translate in um, Spanish or whatever other um, language. I can't, can't remember who all we had translators for besides Spanish, but yeah, it was, the whole process was really fun. And then sitting down and trying to synthesize like, okay, how do we take all the answers to their interview questions and craft it into a story mm. that is, you know, hopefully um, simple enough but gripping enough that like young adults and up can read this and relate to it maybe get inspired mm-hmm. and want to see what's going to happen now with the artemis missions yeah and, and for me the the human connection you know the folks who i speak to who are definitely not in the space industry you know they they speak about it with such uh just nostalgia and you can just see it, people's eyes fill up and i i think it's one thing that um, I'm hopeful that space can offer hope to humanity again in a way that that we had uh, back then. I think I think we still have a, we have a lot of work to do to build the fantastic future that we're we're really looking for. Um, but yeah, that human aspect I think is super important. Do do you find that the people that you've worked with in the space industry do you think there's a lot of focus on the human aspect and kind of the bigger picture of what's being done or um does it get into really the data and and kind of like making sure that whatever is said or or real is backed by data i'd say there's both Mm. um there's definitely a heavy bias in scientists to lead more lean more toward the facts and like Mm. for engineers to lead more toward the technology um and I think this this leads to a little bit of a communications breakdown when it comes to like scientists trying to convey the significance of the work they're doing. Mm-hmm. They might think it's cool. It's like, okay, that's great, but you're also doing work that's funded by taxpayers. And so it's beholden on you to explain to them this, the greater picture of why you're doing the things that you do. Mm-hmm. And I think like across the whole field, the field of science in general, even beyond space, scientists could do a much better job at explaining the why of what they're doing in a way that makes it relatable to non-experts um and and really understanding that the emotional connection is what gets people and i think that space is so good for that because even if people aren't like space fans like the people that were hanging out with on space twitter and stuff (laughs) generally people think space is cool like if i'm talking to you know, if I'm in a setting where somebody typically asks, you know, what your job is, like an Uber driver or a hairstylist or, you know, a a nurse in a doctor's office or something like that, the reaction is always, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I've I've never met someone that's done that. And then they start asking you all these questions that are usually really good. And I think it's because like space is uniquely non-unique, it is the one mm. thing that we all experience. We all have access to looking up to the sky, maybe at different levels of how many stars we can see, but it's yeah. there. It's influenced all of our cultures, mm. like throughout all of history. Yeah. So we have a tie to it in a way that even things on earth are not quite that universal. Like mm. not everyone has seen an ocean. Not everyone has been to a mountain yeah. Th- there are things that we would take for granted probably in the places that we live. Totally. I remember a friend from Australia, uh, she came to the U S for the first time and we took her to Canada. And it was the first time she'd ever seen snow and she was like uh. 17 years old. <laughs> so even simple things like that, yeah. there, there are pieces of the earth experience that not everyone gets to see, but we all get to see space. And so I think we all look up and say, man, what, what's out there what's going on where did mm. where did we come from yeah do, do you think that storytelling is a is a piece of the puzzle for scientists to kind of I, i'm trying to figure out if 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 it's something if it's like a skill that some people have if like a a, a bridge someone who's a bridge for these different departments i, I find myself in that role often where you know, you can kind of help communicate or cross communicate the the miscommunication between the two groups. Um, do, do you think that like having a customer 
uh, or, or, or idealizing the customer is important for, for scientists to understand the why. I'm, I'm searching for ways that we can, we can make things better. And it feels like that for us in the scientific community is something we can work on. Absolutely. I think recognizing that the why is the most important part of mm. all of this, you know, at the end of the day, you're not getting funded to do this stuff like generally so that you stay employed or right. because you're just doing something that's kind of cool. Like you should be contributing to the body of human knowledge in a way that, you know, maybe it isn't something that is going to affect everyone in their day-to-day -day life that that's inevitable, but helping people understand where it can play a role and that big picture I think is important. And yeah, maybe scientists, maybe it's too much to put on scientists themselves to be like, you need to do all the work and yeah. all the communication, like, and be good at storytelling. Yeah. And that's where science communicators really come in handy to act as that translator. Um, it's good to see people trying to build that bridge. Um, mm. And it's also good to see like scientists try to do it themselves because I think, I think there's also some rebranding that needs to be done where scientists don't necessarily come across as so unapproachable or yeah. like, super geniuses like i love to make the example to people like you know you tell somebody you have a phd and they're like oh my god you must be you must be a genius yeah. it's like no i just have a lot of knowledge in one very hyper specific thing yeah. that is not useful in my day-to-day -day life like <laughs> i no one in my day-to-day -day life is going to ask me about landslides on mars generally <laughs> um which is no different than somebody who say you know owns a Volkswagen focused repair shop and has been repairing old beetles for the last 30 years and they know yeah. every in and out of that engine like you're just taking the time to focus on being an expert on one very specific thing mm. and so I want people to understand that like scientists are just people <laughs> yeah. and I, I want that to help foster a dialogue as well I, I want scientists to feel like they can and should answer questions from people I don't want people to feel afraid like a, a lot of reaction mm. that i'll hear from people is like oh i i'm afraid to ask a question because i'll sound dumb to this person that i've idealized as like being a genius and yeah. you're like no that's you should want to ask some questions and they should want to answer them well what's crazy is even i as someone who went for aerospace engineering like my freshman sophomore year was a struggle because i was i still still in the bell curve of this place i felt dumb um, and I felt like I couldn't ask questions. And this podcast is, is the, <laughs> the angst of wanting to ask those questions that just had to happen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, um, it's so important to do that. And I think, thank you for your, your answer on that. Cause that it, it, you're right. It is a lot to ask scientists to just all of a sudden be, to be these extroverted, uh, great communicators. <laughs> um, it is a lot to ask. Um, I like the through an extroverted. That's a huge component too. You're like, oh gosh, yeah. no, no, no. I signed up for this so I could hide in a lab in a basement yeah. and never have to see anybody. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I just work with the numbers and the lab and I'm good. The robots yeah. like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's cool. Um, so as we wind up here, uh, cause I, I don't want to take, we we're, we're closing up. Um, do you have any other thoughts um, for folks who might want to follow uh, a path similar to yours or uh, are just looking to do whatever it is that they're doing, even if they're just interested in science and they're just looking for, you know, how do I how do I get started? Do you have any advice for folks out there like that? Yeah, I mean, right now is probably like the biggest space renaissance since the Apollo era. And but it's even more diverse now because. Mm -hmm basically any job you can think of that you might need on earth, we either currently need or will soon need in space. Mm. And so you don't have to be a scientist or an engineer. If you go look at job postings, even at places like SpaceX, they were hiring a barista recently. Yeah. NASA has photographers. There's, um, oh gosh, what's his name? John Krauss and Ben Cooper on, mm. on Twitter and other social media. They like, I think their whole income now is launch photography for for companies which is so cool and their work is amazing They're i think so one good. of one of john's photos i think is yeah still on my um lock screen now <laughs> um 
yeah, I mean, food scientists, medical doctors, artists, veterinarians. I'm sure people are going to want to bring their dogs. Scientists. Lots of behavioral scientists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably a lot of design people too. Like as yeah. we start thinking Creatives. about. Yeah, I think creatives mm-hmm. is probably going to be the biggest expansion area that we didn't have before because exploring mm-hmm. space was very utilitarian. But now yeah. it's like we need to create places that people want to visit as tourists mm-hmm. or inhabit as people like on the moon or on Mars. There's a lot of things that you need to take into account for that. So, uh, yeah, it's it's such a great time to to find your pathway into space if it's something you want to do as your career. Mm. And if you're just generally interested in space, you don't want to work in it, but you just want to keep up on all the cool things that are happening. It's also a fantastic time in terms of the internet, just the number of podcasts, for example, Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, the number of scientists that are, are just talking about their work on I mean, I would have said Twitter until a few days ago. So wherever yeah. science Twitter ends up moving to rip yeah. science Twitter. Um, but I'm sure that community will reappear somewhere else. Um, yeah. A lot of people are on blue sky and, and I think on threads too, uh, because they seek each other out. Like it, yeah. everybody, they're such excited people. I mean, myself included, I don't know. I'm talking like, <laughs> other people. like you're not excited. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, where are my nerds? Where did you all go? I need the shark <laughs> pictures. I need my like fungi facts. Where is everybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I the great thing is, like you were saying, there there is a ton of opportunity. Um, so I, you know, one of the great things about all these other jobs is it's also, I think, as a secondary function, going to balance a lot of us out as well. Because mm-hmm. as the scientists, we're going to have other people with different cultural backgrounds, different, you know, communication styles, and and we're we're just going to have to adjust to that, and maybe have some cool friends while we're, while we're at work. So, um, <laughs> well, teach us how to be more extroverted. Exactly. Exactly. It's always good. <laughs> Go to the expert, go to the expert. <laughs> exactly. Well, Dr. Tanya Harrison, thank you so much for being on the podcast, uh, for people of science and for being one of our people of science, um, and sharing your STEM's origin story. It was great hearing that from you. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks so much. This was fantastic. Thank Thanks you. for being one of those science communication bridges yes. that we said we needed so much. <laughs> yes, honored, honored to, to play that small role in our tiny spacecraft here in the infinite universe of uh, the internet. So uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for joining us on uh, Today in Space. Spread love and spread science, and we'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space.